start again. My name is Milena Jelinek, and I've been teaching at Columbia University for about 35 years. Now I'm retired, but I teach as a lecturer. Um, and I've been teaching uh, script analysis in the past for, for many, many years, which is a course that was started by Frank Daniel, who was a kind of an enigmatic uh, guru figure who was a dean at FAMU, and then in 68, uh, he escaped and started teaching in the United States. And from that on, uh, on FAMU denied to recognize him, and the United States accepted him with a great deal of love. He was very charismatic. This was actually not something that I thought I would be talking about. So. Now I have to get back to my topic. He was very charismatic, and he, um, in his script analysis, analyzed not only how screenplays are put together, but focused also on the aspect of directing uh, and acting. And it was a lot of fun to watch him. And then when he left Columbia and went to USC, I inherited the, uh, the uh, lecture and had to kind of invent it over again. And I was much less charismatic. Nevertheless, I taught it for many years. So I will not do that. I will not talk about script analysis today because I decided to do something really stupidly ambitious. And maybe it won't come through too well, but anyway. Um, I want to talk about all fiction, not only about movies. Because I think that very often, I um, teach screenwriting, screenwriters uh, for a very long time, very often we are too narrowly uh, focused on only movies and throw around all these uh, rules and prohibitions and uh, it looks like we only know that one paradigm where something happens between the page 22 and 28 and cannot be 15 or 16 and so forth. And everybody reads the same screenwriting books and everybody tries somehow to follow whatever the screenwriting books say. But <clears throat> I wonder whether people read uh, at all. I hope they still do. But even if they don't, we actually carry a great cultural inheritance where we know all sorts of stories. And if we just remember that we know all sorts of stories and that many stories have been told in the past, then perhaps we can look at the movies through a rather larger focus than just studying movies. So one of the things that I want to talk about are beginnings and ends. And as you can see, I am uh, throwing out the middle, because the middle is too, ex too, too difficult. So uh, why fictions, in fact? Uh, this is a, I mean, you know all sorts of answers why we tell stories, but I will tell you another story. Uh, I met a scientist <clears throat> who was a physicist, and he, I guess, didn't like me too much, but he asked me, why these stories? Why this obsession with these stories? It doesn't mean anything, and it's not good for anything. And I got so angry that I couldn't even answer how angry I was. But I knew that there, he was a very smart man, and that I somehow needed to tell him, so I told him, you know, without, without understanding stories and listening to stories, you really don't know the uh, meaning of life or the sense of life and so forth. This man, of, of course, laughed, uh, but <laughs> he was um, at that time working in a large group of speech recognition group, and in fact was working with my husband, and later on took this algorithm that they used for solving the speech problem and applied it to investment. And there was a whole group of people from this speech recognition group 
who understood how to deal in these uh, small amount of variations in stock market and had this algorithm and he became a billionaire. So I just want to tell you that if you don't believe in fictions, you can make a very good, <laughs> very good life. Thing. <laughs> Nevertheless, this is one of the questions. Why do we obsess about stories? And from the beginning of our existence on Earth, we were telling stories. And the reason for it is, uh, I think, that we have to make sense of life. And somehow, it's very hard. And we therefore invent fictions to help us understand life. Because if we try to just record life, just tell everything as it was, the meaning eludes us anyway. So all these kind of ways of abstraction are really trying to get to some picture of life that, that is uh, you know, that is what we are wondering about. So the beginning, and why? Because we are here only for a short time. We begin and we'll, we end. And in, the, in, in between the end and the, and between the beginning and the end, there is this big middle. We are always in the middle. We are not done with life till we die. So when we look at our life, uh, we would look somewhat at the beginning. It's a kind of a vague beginning. We were born. We were not really present at the time. And then it goes in the middle and goes in the middle, and then it stops. And people looks, look at our life and say, aha, this person meant this. And they somehow understand the meaning of our life. But we want to understand the meaning of life before we die. So we look toward the fiction and uh, try to make sense of this span somehow through fiction. We know that the life began sometimes very far away. And we are not sure when the life will end. But we make predictions. We make, and this is something that is hanging over us all the time. So there is one great book, which is called the Bible. And it came not, you know, there were other things before the Bible, but let's say at, at the Bible for, for, the, for the time being. And in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And then it continues, <clears throat> and it, one thing after another, till we come to the end. And the end is the apocalypse. It's the book of revelations. And uh, the strange thing is that actually, when we look at the Old Testament, we have a very nice beginning. It's in seven days. We have all sorts of stories that go after. But we really, in the Old Testament, don't have a, a story of the end. Because the Jews actually were waiting for the Messiah and didn't come. So you know, what end? They, they didn't quite make the end of it. Only later, they started supplying some answers about the end. In fact, we have a holiday. Rosh Hashanah, where is the beginning of the new year, and we have Yom Kippur, which is really about the end, where we look and pray for people who died. Uh, and also, there is a belief that those people who died were written in the Book of Life. OK, so that's the Jews. The Christians came, and for them, they took the beginning, <clears throat> but now the Messiah came and redeemed them, and did all, all those wonderful things. And now they wanted the second coming. One was not enough. <laughs> it didn't, they didn't solve the problem. So they wanted the second coming. And they thought <clears throat> the second coming will not be so easy. There will be other things that will happen. And that is the book of Revelations, as you know. I don't read the Bible, so if I make a mistake, I mean, I didn't go through it entirely. You can correct me. And the book of Revelations actually um, 
caused a lot of trouble for the church because it came with all these strange predictions and prophecies, and you all know them, or at least heard of some of them. We have all these um, seven seals, a woman dressed with sun, uh, or I have to look, um, uh, the three and a half years of reign of the Antichrist, the you know empire in decadence and all this kind of turmoil and violence that then leads to the second coming and the and the judgment and the time stops time stops so we have in the christian or in this biblical point we have the beginning and the time continues till it reaches the end uh, in other philosophies, we, like for instance in Greek philosophies, we don't really have a real beginning. There is some kind of matter, matrix or whatever it forms, and then we have cycles. We have kind of a cyclical repetition. We have succession of generations, and we have different kind of myths because it's the cycle that covers the time. And we also don't have a real end. We have a cycle. So it starts and it goes back and it just uh, 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 continues. And um, there is, I, I'm, um, I have to uh, mention two books, actually. Uh, none of them is terribly uh, famous, but interesting. I myself like occasionally to read those theoretical books about literature because I never know what catches my fancy and it's kind of always interesting to find some different look at what stories mean or how stories continue. So one of the books that I used when I was looking at this, uh, at this topic was a book called The Sense of an Ending by Frank Kermode, K-E-R-M-O-D-E, -E, who, who was a literary theoretician in the 50s, 60s, and 80s. And this book is published. You can, you can look at it. And he uses many of the examples uh, and many of these concepts that, that I mentioned. And the other book that I sometimes use in my lectures is by Northrop Frye, who is a really kind of a, uh, now out of fashion totally, but he's a Canadian literary theorist who focused his attention exactly to the cyclical ways of looking at literature. And uh, <clears throat> I think he went over the line, but used, you know, but it's still interesting because I think it's quite original. And he studied archetypes and cluster of archetypes and things like uh, the city on the hill, cross, Christ, uh, the ritual and the dream and myths. And he associated various types of stories with various seasons. Now, that's kind of crazy, but still interesting. When things are crazy, they are always interesting. So if you, for instance, want to look at him, I think uh, you, you would have to have a lot of patience. But his um, book is, uh, I think, no, Critical Studies or something like that. I forgot, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll remember. So he was. Um, saying this, that uh, what happens in a myth is the conflict of, between the human action and a kind of a dream logic. The, the uh, conflict between the reality and the dream then creates a myth. And I will tell you an example of a myth, which is, I always forget, which is taken from one Egyptian tale of two brothers that was then later uh, used for Potif Potiphar wife in, you know, I think it's in the Bible. But anyway, there is a tale of two brothers. The wife 
desires the younger brother. He doesn't want her, uh, pushes her away. She gets very angry, and she tells her husband, he it was trying to get me. And the, and the older brother goes and wants to get him, and the younger brother runs. So far, we're in realism. We understand it. And if uh, we follow the ritual, he would probably be put to death or whatever they did in Egypt. But lo and behold, uh, the god Ra created a lake between the, those two brothers and filled it with crocodiles. Now, when you take an invention like that, all of a sudden, you know, we're in a dream. We're, we don't quite know why the crocodiles, why the lake, but it works. He got away. So that's myth, and that's really fiction, OK? So uh, th these, these kind of examples of similar thinking you have in folk tales, in fairy tales. You know, you have the wonderful wishes coming through. Or you have nightmares full of ogres and giants and witches and so forth. This actually, when you look at contemporary films, still applies. There are still fairy tales and there are still nightmares. And these types of thinking, these types of uh, characters appear in, in the film. The, this type of wish, wishful fulfillment is typical for popular, for, for popular art. And we would frown on it, except that we engage in it. Because movies are very close to popular art, and we do it without blushing. But the problem always comes when we start thinking, this really must be done differently. Because these old paradigms, these paradigms of beginning, middle, end, uh, these, these paradigms based on myths or, 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 or these types of studies cannot be applied anymore to our world. So when the skepticism comes in and when you start questioning these types of uh, uh, popular thinking or, or these requirements of the, these kind of pleasing requirements of the story where the beginning starts something and the end puts it into consonance, into, uh, you know, into uh, harmony, okay? Uh, sometimes uh, you want to break it as, as an artist uh, because you want to actually show the real life. You, you want to show the life that we know today. And we don't have the rituals that used to make sense of how we live, and we question everything. So we question beginnings, and we question endings. And the middle is one continuous crisis and, and mess. So when you look, for instance, at something like Waiting for Godot by Becker, you know, where is the beginning? Two guys appear on the stage, and we don't know where they came from. And that is a denial of beginning. Because in usual stories, you somehow understand either they are types, or we get information about the characters. You somehow understand where they are coming from. Here, we don't. And we don't know the ending. They are waiting for God, and he doesn't show. And it can go on forever, well, then it gets too long, so it ends. So that's one of kind of experiments that people do. Uh, it, you, for instance, could say, OK, I'm not dealing with beginning, and I'm not dealing with ending. I'm just going to see what's around me. I am not going to look for plots. I am just going to show life as it is. And in fact, people do it in documentary films, but people do it sometimes in fictional films too. So, you know, that gets very confusing, and people in workshops tell you, don't do it. You won't get any people in the theater. But still, it's one of the things that 
I understand when you question. I understand that you get very uh, angry, uh, and I used to be the same way till I stopped worrying about it, when you are told you need the beginning, you need the middle, things have to happen uh, for a reason, and you have to have an end that resolves everything that's, that was before. If you are a reader, you know that they, there are many attempts in literature, in serious art, uh, to deny this. For instance, there are writers who, and where in France, Sartre and Rob Grier, that try to do with, 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 try to do away with the determinism. They didn't want to say the character comes from here and therefore the character comes from, from here. He will do this and that. They wanted to create or understand the confusion and the chaos that we live in. Uh, all these things are possible and all these things you should not forget. Because when, when you uh, actually encounter them <clears throat> in film, they are puzzling, they are disturbing, and sometimes you think about them and you try to do them. So for instance, let's talk about time, the concept of time. As I said, in the old paradigm, with the biblical beginning and the biblical ending, you have time that flows forward because there is somewhere to flow, that is toward the ending, and when it reaches ending, time stops, okay? So you want to do the time, the chronological time, the chronos, the time as it is, and you know that to try to do it is very, very difficult, and it has been tried, and it's really boring, and if you try to do it, you will be defeated by, by your effort. Nevertheless, it is something that people think about and worry about. What am I showing? How true am I to the sense of life? We all know that our life goes day by day. We all know that this type of existence is very puzzling. We all know that. So how do you show it in film? Well, I don't know. It's up to you to find out. But I, know, I want you to remember that. There are also moments that I think are called kairos. I don't know whether I'm mispronouncing um, Greek. But there are moments that are significant where something happens that uh, we see the time is switched away. I mean, is switched and something significant happens at that moment, and we look for these moments in our chronological life or in the chronological life of the character, and then we understand, oh, this happened, and because this happened, something else is going to happen, or you push the character toward the next significant moment, okay? So that's another way of dealing with time. Uh, I'm really jumping around, but anyway. Uh, uh, wait, wait, I just um, I'm lost for now. Um, <coughs> when, when you have the type of stories that are tied to the cyclical uh, pattern, you, you go through the season. So there, again, there is not the marching of time that goes from the imagined beginning to the imagined end, but it goes through the season. And when you have that, you have a kind of a sense of, fine, this generation goes through this cycle, and then there is a next generation, and after it is a next generation, and there is a sense that life continues through generations. And that's the kind of uh, primitive uh, uh, way of looking at time that occurs in myths, in legends, and uh, mm, 
uh, it's again a way of looking on, yes, it's, it's, it's a dealing with eternity. I mean, how far are we going? Well, we hope that we will continue because we have these generations of people <laughs> continue and continue. You know that you yourself probably are preoccupied with uh, trying to understand the end of time, trying to understand the end of life, trying to understand the end of a planet. Uh, I don't want to go very far into, I'm not a philosopher, but I think that this type, this, this feeling of fear of f future uh, in influences a lot of our stories. When you look at movies, I sometimes am amazed. Uh, when you look at these disaster movies that Hollywood produces and puts tremendous amounts of money, you know, you really wonder what it is. Is it the extinction of an empire? I mean, are we actually predicting the uh, end of uh, American empire? Or are we predicting the end of life on planet? There are always some guys up in the sky that come and want to do us away, do away with us, but miraculously Hollywood save us. But this obsession with future, with future destruction, uh, is tied to this fear of future. And you know that you have fear of future because you know that planet is in danger, okay? But I just want to tell you that this type of thinking, this type of dealing with disasters, with the future, with trying to understand where, where life begins and life ends, it was present always. I'm not saying that this guarantees your future, I have no idea. But I want you to know that you deal with it. All these things that, that, that you are trying to write about, you really are dealing with this very large picture. And I want to also emphasize that there are very many examples that you can look at and that can influence you in literature, in drama, in poetry, and have been around for a, for a long time. So that was uh, my attempt to uh, try to look at beginnings and end in a, in a little bit larger context, okay? So um, I think uh, I, I want to mention the conflict between a deterministic end and the freedom of individuals. So, you know, when, when you think psychologically that this character will do only certain things, you are actually working with determinism. And you are forgetting that we are makers of our own fate, that we are free to make our fate. And that therefore, characters in your stories are unpredictable and will do things that when you start writing, you didn't even dream of. And you need to remember that. You need to remember that, and I'm just saying it because there are all these um, textbooks that you read about screenwriting and all these character studies. And what it really, now, now I, I will quote, uh, Ortega y Gasset, I don't know if I, if I pronounce it uh, correctly, okay, yes. uh, talks about man's duty to make himself, all right? <laughs> so he says, I invent projects of being and doing in the light of circumstance. circumstance. It is often forgotten that man is impossible without imagination, without the capacity to invent for himself a conception of life. So this is what I want you to remember, that you need to explore freely and without fear all these meanings that are all around us, that you need to count on your imagination, that you should not fear your imagination, and that you should always try to make sense of the life as you see it around yourself, but not through necessarily realism, 
but through imagination. Okay? And that, that, I think, needs to enter a little more into the filmmaking rather than the strictures that you hear here in the workshop, and you would hear them from me, because I am, of course, engaged in the process of making your story come into some form and shape. And I would always tell you, yes, but your character is this. Why is he doing this? And I would doubt uh, your invention. But actually, uh, you know, stick to your guns. If you are aware of what you're doing, if you are not just making up stories for making up stories, you are making stories for a very serious reason. You are examining life, you are examining the sense of life, you are sh looking at your own life and try to figure out how it means, uh, makes sense. So now I will, I didn't think that I will do it, but I am going to tell you something about myself uh, because I am now at the age of trying to make sense of my life. And <clears throat> I will go to the beginning. I was born in 1935. So I'm here long enough to see various empires fail. <coughs> One was the Third Reich, and the other was the fall of communism. And now, now I'm in the United States, and I wonder what's going to come next. <laughs> but I was born in 1935, and my when I think about my life, I think about one moment that is very puzzling, <clears throat> and that must have happened in 1938, so I was three, <clears throat> where I saw through a window my father coming back in the uniform, in a uniform. And I saw that it was a kind of a I, 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 I'm sure that I welcomed him and it was a good feeling, but it was a strange moment because he usually was not in a uniform and he was coming from somewhere. Then I remember that I was sitting in a car, in some car, I was sitting very high and we were moving through the night and I just saw the light as it was shining on the road and on the trees. So that was some image of an escape. Uh, later, I understood what it was. My father returned from mobilization in 1938. Uh, the uh, Munich Accord was signed. The Czechoslovak Republic lost the borders and all the defenses. The um, arms had to be laid down. And the, the, the uh, road that I, I see in my imagination was there because my father was afraid that the Germans are going to come from, uh, we, we, we lived very close to, uh, to a road that he felt they would come there and he tried to save us and he, he took us into some countryside in some cottage, okay. So those are the, the beginnings where I started understanding perhaps that something is going on in, at a very early age. 35 years after that, I came back to Czechoslovakia because by then I was already living in the United States. And I was with my father, in fact on a train. I got really angry at him for, because he was talking to a German who came to look at, uh, you know, was looking for memories. He spent nice years of his youth in Czechoslovakia doing what, I don't know. But my, my father was talking to him in a very happy mood. And, and I turned to him and said, why didn't you fight in 1938? <laughs> and he said, you wouldn't have a father. If we fought, I would have died. And I thought to myself, yes, but what happened after the time that you didn't fight? So I felt that this was a really strange question that I asked. And I only asked it because 
I left the country. I left the way everybody else was thinking. And everybody else was thinking, yes, we had to put down the arms. There was nothing else to do. What happened by putting down the arms was that actually uh, the, the war started anyway and pretty fast and with the weaponry and the stuff that the, the German army got for free from the Czechs, they invaded Poland and it started. I'm not blaming my father, of course, but at that moment I was wondering why these people put down their weapons. Why am I telling this to you? This really defines me. This really led to my escape. My life has been about an escape. I didn't want to put up with that kind of country, with those kind of people, and I wanted to escape, and I did, and paid a big price for that. So when we think about stories, uh, there are stories of escape, and there are stories of chase. And Frank Daniel said, those are the two movements that you really follow in stories. Either it's an escape or it's a chase. Well, actually, there is always a chase in an escape because somebody goes after you also. But you're talking about a story of an escape. So now I came to the first, uh, to the first uh, uh, example that I want to show you. Where, where is Karini? I should make, I should signal for that, okay. Uh, I will show you Thelma and Louis, the beginning of Thelma and Louis and the end of Thelma and Louis. And Thelma and Louis is a movie about escape. And so I want to show you how you start a movie and how that is actually connected to the sense of life and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll talk about the ending too. Uh, I, I want to show you about the, the first uh, sequence that's about eight or 10 minutes long and then I want to show just a, a little piece of, At the end. of, of from the other set sequence. But there is one thing that is different, and that is they are going away together for the weekend. So that's the escape, that, that is starting the escape. You see, if you watch it carefully, you see the kind of reality that is there, and also the kind of satirical look at that reality. Especially in uh, Thelma's house, uh, you can see that the husband is made fun of constantly and that he comes across as a jerk. There is somebody who certainly ought to be escaped from. And uh, you have this feeling of lightness. There is a kind of a melancholy music in the beginning and a kind of melancholy landscape that, uh, that we connect with the West. But in this, I, don't, I think it was eight minutes, we see these two characters, uh, it's, it's parallel cutting, and we see them each at their environment. We see Louis as somebody who is a waitress, uh, who is choking with the customers, who is at ease, but who also has a kind of an edgy response to men because she puts down the co-worker co there. And we also understand that there is something about her personal life because she tries to connect with Jimmy, but Jimmy isn't home and she doesn't leave a note. You, you see through the acting, through the casting, and through the costumes that she is an older character, that she is kind of uh, more rigid, constricted. You see the jacket, the, the you know, the, the um, uh, blouse button up, and so forth. And that she is fond of Thelma. We don't yet know why, but Thelma seems to be chaotic. Here again, you see some attempt and showing her chaotic life. And also, unfortunately, you see what Chekhov has always wrote about, that if you use 
a gun, you have to show it right away. If there is a gun in the drawer, you show the gun. <laughs> well, indeed, the, the gun is shown uh, in various ways, uh, about three times, uh, and it's always nice to show things three times because that means that the audience will remember. So first she takes it from the drawer, then she and she takes it this way, and then she shows it to Thelma and says, I, I don't know how to use it, you do something with it. And Thelma says, put it in my purse. So we know there are signs that something is coming, but we don't know exactly what. Uh, Thelma mentions they are going to the woods, to the mountains. She is afraid that there might be some problems. She wants to have a gun with her. She wants to have a Latin. They are going to be psycho killers, and we have to. So this actually is a strategy by the writer and the director to uh, cue us in for the story, but also to divert uh, us from the expectation, from from the thing they are coming. We expect something light. So this beginning, how is it going to end with, with, with the actual end? Well, Thelma and Thelma, uh, Louis takes a picture, if you remember, a picture of them leaving, okay? So that kind of, the picture then comes back. So, um, I think I want to show you also, I want to show you also a part, if you can go into the second, uh, to the dance, when, when, the, when there is a singer and then they start dancing. And okay, I'm trying to find it. It's, I don't know where it is, but it's probably 20 minutes in. 20 minutes Yeah, you, you just go. So we have two characters. Um, but you see, it came <laughs> 20 minutes into the film. Hard not to notice two such uh, pretty ladies as yourselves. Finally, what is it about the life she hasn't yet sampled? And uh, there is the seductive man, Harlem, who comes and she sees there is an offer of fun, and Louis warns her, but she really doesn't pay attention. And there is this beautiful guy who starts singing. That's the that's the guy she will really like. That's that's where the fun begins. And the dance is an expression of fun. And both, you can see that both the characters have certain problems. Thelma with her uh, naivete and the sense of entitlement. She will have fun under any circumstances. And Louis, uh, you know, being constricted, being rigid, and being worried, basically. Now, I want to, uh, not really because you certainly can look at the film again, I want to talk about the writer, uh, Kelly Curry. Um, there is an introduction, an interview with her, 
in front of the printed version of the screenplay that is available, you can get it. And it's very interesting. That's where I have the information. I don't know her personally. So she was very much like you in her late 20s, early 30s, and she was hanging on the edges of the film industry, uh, working for, uh, I think, music videos and taking acting classes. And uh, she did not have a sense of that she will ever do anything significant. So she was, this was like uh, early 90s. And she was thinking about doing something that would be different. She, of course, couldn't get ahead or couldn't really. There is, a, of course, a difficulty for women in film industry. It's well known. And she felt that. She felt that she couldn't get ahead. So she was looking for some ways of getting ahead and had this terrific idea. She wanted to show two women on a crime spree, okay? So look at that idea. This is really an idea that is kind of calculated. I mean, it responds to her wanting to do something active for women. It responds to her uh, wanting to get somehow ahead in the industry, do something that hasn't been done before, okay? You can imagine the kind of story she could have come up with. Probably some, you know, adventure um, stories of robbing or whatever. But she had, and this is how, in various uh, combinations, this is how ideas come about. You have a feeling, you have a need, you don't quite know what it is, but you have some vague idea, and nothing comes of it. And then another moment comes, and all of a sudden, you feel, now I have it or maybe two moments, but to her, the moment came where she was walking alone home in the evening, at night, and there was an older guy in the, sitting in the car, and he said, suck my dick. And her response was, if I had a gun, I would have killed him. And out of that anger at the, you know, at the uh, kind of uh, way of men talking to women and using women came a feeling that she's going to do something about that. And she came up with a character, it took some time, it's, you know, as you know, it's not uh, very easy to come up with ideas. She came up with a character who was, um, who, who was, uh, raped and the, she went to the police and she was actually not believed and she argued and whatever and was even put in prison and that happened in Texas. This was her idea for Louis. And then when she started and so she, she didn't quite know what Louis did for a living and she thought Louis is probably some kind of <laughs> Uh, executive in the oil industry because it was in Texas and she was thinking about it and then she said all of a sudden when I started to write I heard the sound of uh, clicking uh, coffee cups of washing coffee cups and the hum of the of the uh, restaurant and, and she she found Louis as a waitress so when you Look at this, there was a connection to her life. You, you can see also that she knew a lot about the characters, that she constructed a long uh, backstory. Actually, we will all find out about that backstory. And now again is the question, where do I begin? Where is the beginning of the story? Is the beginning in Louis's rape in Texas, should she start there? Well, you, you could. You would, you would do a sequence of Louis uh, in Texas, this happens, it will take 10 minutes or so, and then you cut to her some years later and now she's dealing with, with that problem. 
Now, you know that <laughs> an experienced story editor will tell you that you ought to always open the story close to the stuff that happens in the screenplay. So if you have like a backstory that takes some time before, you try to incorporate it into the story rather than set it, it up from. But this was a, a very important secret for Louise. This was an experience that she didn't want to talk about. That was a secret that even Thelma didn't know, although Thelma was her friend. And this was the motivation that pulled the trigger when she shot the guy who was raping Thelma. OK, so. Uh, I don't know that I have persuaded you exactly how this story starts, but this was the moment when she shoots the guy where the escape, you know, takes another turn and becomes a real escape. So if you know the story, you know what else happens, and you would, for instance, find out that the pretty boy that was kind of uh, foreshadowed in the, in the singing here in this scene comes actually in the story and does provide Thelma with fun. And not only that, the fun turns into a crucial development where he steals the money that they had for their escape and in fact prevents their escape. Uh, we will discover all sorts of things about the women as, as we go through the story. For instance, we will discover that Thelma married her, her boyfriend from high school, which was probably a mistake, that she stayed home, that she didn't work. When we look at it today, we feel that it's a little out of date because today a young woman has to work just to make a living. Uh, but at that time, it wasn't all that unusual. Also, it depends what kind of jobs were available at the town, wherever they lived. So now we had a beginning that works works for the story that follows. It triggers an escape. It's a question of life and death. Will they escape? They want to escape to Mexico, uh, and they want to start a new life in Mexico. But how to get the money for the escape is the problem. And Luis uses her boyfriend, and she asks him for money, and he actually does bring the money. And then she breaks up with him and tells him, it's good for you. You don't need to know what the money is for, and I want to protect you. So OK, we will, we will skip the middle, but we know that this story is about the escape. And now let's see whether we can get the last, uh, about the last 10 minutes of the story, OK? This is why I was talking about the apocalypse. This is why I was talking about heaven. How do you get to that end? You know, and I know I'm not going to apologize for all the cliches that you could certainly pick up as you look at it. <laughs> but you look at the ending, and there is a picture. You see the picture on the seat, and then it comes again. It, there is a freeze of the picture. But look at the kind of apocalyptic force that is, uh, that is unleashed against these two women. And look at the, OK, the dialogue, when, when you see it cold like this at the end, you know, sounds a little phony. But I will talk about a part, one part of uh, the, the story that we need to talk about still. But you see that ending, actually, is, you know, how did they come up with? Because why not? Because there are fairy tales. Because that is heaven, because they could do it. Okay. So it is a popular fiction. It is a popular entertainment. But it does, or at least did in the 90s, really tie, tie to the feeling of the era. Where, where women felt that they, they, were, that they needed to advance because 
their work was needed in the society and that they were being uh, encroaching on a territory of men and that men reacted with some fear and resentment and anger. I'm not saying that this is only about economy, it's not about economy. It's about life. It's about the difficulty of how we get along and so forth. So um, I think that in, 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 if you consider the opening and the ending, we have really uh, traveled a big, a, a long way to get from the opening to the ending. But it is connected. It is connected through their friendship, through their desire to escape, through being reaching for freedom that they didn't have in the beginning when they started. So I think uh, I wanted to say, so OK, the want of these two girls is clear. They want to escape. That's what makes them uh, double protagonists. But they are different, because they are two different people. And you can have uh, questions of who is carrying the action, when. And in fact, if you study the screenplay and the, and the movie, you see that for a time, Louis carries the action. And then there is a change, and Thelma carries the action. There is a moment that precedes this uh, way, the climax of the second act, uh, where uh, they realized what they need. So far, they were clear on their want. They want to escape. They want to live. They don't want to give up. But what they need, actually, is to let go. And there is a moment in, and they are actually doing it all through the, all through the, th the escape. Louis uh, lets go by uh, getting rid of makeup and the head and whatever. There is a moment, if you remember, in the desert, where there is a kind of a magical, uh, magical evening uh, when they are just looking. And there is not much dialogue. But you can see that they become kind of attuned to nature, attuned to the fact of dying, attuned to uh, taking in the consequences and letting go. And that's something that both needed to reach, actually, before the ending. And here in the ending, you have the repetition, where they say, I would have done it over again. But we saw this. It was much clearer in the almost silent scene in the desert that came just before the turning point of the second act. So I don't know whether I persuaded you exactly with this commercial Hollywood masterpiece. But uh, actually, I want to say that Kelly Curry wanted to direct this movie herself and was looking for ways of raising money. And she wrote the, uh, wrote the screenplay and imagined it kind of gritty, with no big stars, with no big music, with no big color. Uh, in fact, the, the car was red in her screenplay. Anyway, um, uh, somehow or other, as things sometimes happen, it got into Scott Ridley's hands. And he decided to work with her on the screenplay. And that, of course, changed everything uh, for either better or worse. It depends on how you look at it. But this kind of elegy, the kind of uh, wide screen, screen look at the beautiful landscape that shows the, um, you know, the aggression of the technology, the aggression of the trucks, the movement, or that against this absolutely beautiful landscape that we all know from four movies, you know, all this Arizona thing, um, that almost made it into a legend. You know, this type of style, this, this kind of look at it. And it, it's interesting that it came from Ridley Scott, who actually is not an American, is British and worked in, I think, music, in, did music videos or advertising or whatever. So it's this mythologizing look at an American story in this American landscape 
And I think it is quite a beautiful film to look at. So that, that's the beginning and end of Thelma and Louise. And I just want to draw your attention to all the kind of beginnings and all the kind of endings that could have been done here. They could have gone to Mexico. They could have gone to prison together. They, the story could have started differently. But this is what we ended up with. And now I want to show you if uh, you still, still feel like sitting through. I have a totally different film called The Conformist uh, and, um, and a totally different beginning. Uh, I will just tell you something about it. Conformist is an adaptation of uh, a novel by Alberto Moravia. And I don't know if you ever read the novel I did, because I had to prepare my lecture a long time ago. And the Moravia is a kind of a leftist uh, member of the Communist Party in Italy. And I think the Moravia is actually uh, not his name, um, real name. And he, he for reasons that you know are probably influenced by the time, wanted to write a story of a conformist, a story of a collaborator with the fascist government, and why this uh, uh, person got into it. And the novel is terribly Freudian. I mean, it's really, when you read it, you, you don't quite believe it, because it goes from the childhood, begins in the childhood, and the kid kills flies and whatever, and is molested, and it goes you know, through the development of the conformist. What's brilliant about it, uh, and I want to call attention to it to you, is to try to understand not the victim, but the perpetrator. This is something that is more interesting. So, because, you know, writing stories about victims is easier. So this is a difficult story to tell, and let's see how it starts, okay? Again, how many people know the conformists? Well, not everybody. But uh, so I will just tell you what this is. He has been sent on a mission. Uh, we open in Paris where he's about to go to that mission. That's the phone call. He's picked up by his uh, driver. We don't really see the driver. I didn't know exactly how long this flashback is, and I didn't want to continue. But this is intercar. Uh, this is the trip in the car to do the mission that he has agreed, uh, because he wants to serve this government. He wants to be like everybody else. He wants, and it is explained. You can see that it is discussed with this blind friend, again, blind uh, is very important here. And the, the beautiful singers that are there is to show how ordinary life was nice under fascism. There was nothing wrong with that. And he goes, and you can see the uh, stylistic uh, expression of this bigness that, that he wants to join through this, the big hall that he goes in. So he ex uh, uh, accepts a mission, which we don't really know about, but discover as the flashback structure continues. Why does it start here? And why the flashback structure? Uh, I don't, actually, I didn't, you know, it's been some time that I saw it. I don't know when he actually uh, reaches the wood. His mission is, to kill his old professor who is now living in Paris uh, because he is an inspiration for the dissenters in Italy. He is in correspondence with people who are dangerous to, uh, for the Italians. And, and he, he becomes, when he comes to uh, Paris, he goes to the uh, professor, the professor, uh, remembers him, he introduces his sexy fiance, 
and uh, the professor has a young uh, enigmatic um, wife who becomes who who actually uh, this guy becomes fascinated with but she becomes fascinated with his wife and so this is all we discover as he goes for the kill. And as we discovered from the beginning, there is a surprise uh, for him. Uh, the wife is with his, uh, with the professor, so he has to, he will have to kill both of them. The killing scene is terrific. You just have to see it, how beautifully it is done. So here we open the movie very close to the climactic moment where, where he kills. But within this tension, because we now discover slowly what the assignment is, and we are asking, will he do it or won't he do it? And there are obstacles in his way. Finally, he does it, and we go into the third act. Okay. Um, let's just look at um, maybe the that's part of the third act, uh, 10 minutes from the end. Uh, there again, you will understand why I'm talking about an apo apocalypse. Because this is clearly the ending of an era. It's a, it's a fall of the empire. Uh, and people are faced with a total collapse and a total change of life, OK? Uh, I, you know, this is a very difficult movie. I don't think it can be repeated. Um, the structure, as, as it is, uh, as it finally they settle down, I don't know whether this is true, and you might have better information, but Frank Daniel used to say that, that they came on the structure on the, in the editing room that they decided to start uh, with, uh, with him going to do the deed and in between do the flashbacks. And the flashbacks are not in a continuous chronological order, but uh, jump all over the place. So we get the story of his uh, being molested by a gay guy when he was young. We get his story of his hatred of his mother, uh, and uh, he, we get the story of wanting to be a part of ordinary life by picking this bourgeois girl. We get a very funny story and beautifully narrated of the girl on the train. The train sequence is something that you just have to remember. It's a miracle. Where she tells him, we see, we see you know, the uh, uh, images of the landscape going by uh, through the window of the moving train. And she tells him this story, how she was befriended by a friend of her father, who was a much older man. And he started sleeping her very early in her life, and how nice it was. And he wants to know, you know, when it ended, and it, it just looks like it never ended. But, but you know, there is, a, there are moments like, you know, beautiful jewel pieces that you need to look at. So are we back? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Well, farther than that? Maybe farther. Yeah, a little bit farther. When he's on the bridge. Um, No, because he's going to visit Patrick. Okay, this just for those who didn't see the film, uh, the man who, the homosexual that he attacks is the man from the flashbacks you would have known who molested him or wanted to molest him when he was a schoolboy and he got a hold of a gun, the boy, and uh, shot him and thought he killed him. And that was a kind of a um, guilt or disturbing thing that 
that was obsessing him. That's why he wanted to be normal. He was constantly trying to fight against the accusation that perhaps he's a homosexual or not a homosexual, or whatever. So that was, that was the connection to the man. But you can see again the beginning, the connection with the beginning. So we saw the mission that he accepts, and we see the uh, fiance there on the bed. and. Here, at the end of the movie, she's his wife, they have a daughter, and she brings up the story of the murder of the quadri, and is afraid that if he goes out, that he will be exposed as a fascist. We saw in the beginning, very close to the beginning, that his best friend, the, the guy who induced him or, you know, into the fascist uh, party is this blind man, and he betrays him and exposes him. He also accuses the homosexual of the murder of the quadri, okay? So, and at the same time, there is this feeling of descending into hell. When you see the fire, the darkness, the strange, you know, I don't know where it is in, uh, the, 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 the columns, the people who are emerging, and, and you know, all the prostitutes and all the ragtag people that are around. And now he's there joining them, and you can see the exchange of the look, the look through the, through the actually um, bars. So here is another structure that you can see where the beginning and the end uh, are connecting very significantly. Uh, and you can see it when you look only at the beginning and only at the end, because when you look at the middle, you get involved in the story and you kind of forget what's going on. So I am not going to keep you, I have two more movies. I will only tell you which they are and you can look at them. One movie is called Repulsion by Roman Polanski, a genre film, horror film, but again done with a brilliance that is breathtaking. Uh, at least look sometimes in the future at the 20 minutes of the opening, which is absolutely faultless. The, the thing that uh, follows after is not that interesting, but the beginning is just fantastic. There the ending, you know, it's, uh, trying to somehow understand the woman who murders, and it's not that great, but there is a picture that is very enigmatic and it ends there. But it's the beginning that is just, you can see uh, uh, into this woman who remains almost silent through these 20 minutes. And then I brought another, another uh, picture just to show you what is done in the kind of a Rococo Hollywood that we have now. I mean, the overabundance of detail and, uh, um, and it's collateral. And again, if you look at the beginning, you can see the tremendous engine, you know, churning up all these little details. And you can see how a genre picture is connected to the stories of devil. You know, you can see the entrance of the silver fox, uh, Tom Cruise, who is excellent. I mean, in, in a negative role, I'll take him. Otherwise, he's a hero, I don't know. But that, again, is a beautiful beginning, although uh, there is a very clumsy sequence where he connects with the woman who then disappears for a long time in the story, so there is a sequence that's devoted to their uh, conversation, and it's a little clumsy. But that's for what I wanted to tell you about beginnings and endings and making the sense of life, which I can't do anyway, but right. <laughs> okay.